Right, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, we're back at ARV or Innovate. We are live. Uh, really great session that we've just had on retail and tourism. I do hope quite a few of you had a chance to do some networking there. And also do visit our uh, sponsors. Uh, there's a series of uh, booths there that you can visit. And also, I'm um, just getting an echo here. Sorry, I'm not sure, just getting an echo, but I will continue on. And uh, if I can introduce the chair of the medical healthcare panel, Neil O'Driscoll, please take it away. Thanks very much, Alex. Um, I know we have one one more person, uh, Alex, you might take a look at there, uh, Adrian, to help her uh, get into the panel. Uh, so everybody, uh, thank you very much. It's And thank you, Alex, for uh, pulling the, the panel together um, and uh, giving us this opportunity. We've been, uh, we had some great discussions before this. Uh, so let me introduce, without further ado, introduce the panel and uh, who we have speaking today. We have Dr. Nisha Collins, postdoctoral researcher at Ready? the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. Uh, we have Dr. Adrian Fleming, who's a lecturer in science in TU Dublin. Uh, Dr. Alistair McBride, who's Deputy Medical Director of Pfizer Ireland, and Mr. James Hayes, CEO at Virtual Medical Coaching. So you're all very welcome. Delighted to see everybody again. Uh, and I know, as, as we expect with all these things, and as somebody who's always uh, having to um, present technology, it always goes wrong. Uh, just as you're about to uh, you know, elucidate about the wonders of it, it, it normally fails. So uh, no doubt we'll have some glitches, as you may have seen throughout the morning, but we'll, 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 uh, we'll plow on. So we want to talk broadly here about kind of uh, XOR technology. We're going to talk more specifically about virtual reality in healthcare. Um, and a lot of what we've discussed really does has come down to, to education, how important education is when it comes to healthcare professionals, when it comes to students, when it comes to patients. Um, a little bit of background for myself, first of all, uh, I'm the co-founder of Vstream Health. Uh, and we create patient-centric virtual reality experiences. Uh, and for us, that's a mix uh, you know, of, of using patient insights and healthcare uh, insights. So understanding, having that empathy for the people that are gonna be using the actual experience. Um, immersive technology, of course, uh, virtual reality. Um, Character-led storytelling is another element that's very important to us. Uh, and then we use digital mental health techniques and all of that really combines to create uh, something that, that has that, that has empathy, that has education, uh, that has empowerment for, for patients, uh, and ultimately creates a, a more uh, a, a better outcome uh, uh, for, for all patients involved, or uh, improves the education for healthcare professionals. So that's very, very briefly, that's where we're coming from. Um, but first of all, I want to go to uh, you, Nisha. Um, can you talk, talk a little bit about, I suppose, your journey from, from Dublin to Connemara and your journey into uh, immersive technology and a little bit about Gale Tech VR. Uh, perfect. Thanks, me and Niall. So hi, everybody again. So um, basically, my journey with all virtual reality technology and everything started with my PhD, where I made an application called Gale Tech VR, which is all about teaching people about Irish language learning. So where that came from for me is I was originally from County Wicklow. And I moved over to Connemara when I was young. And within a year, I was immersed in the Irish language. And after a year in this environment, suddenly I was a fluent Irish speaker. So when I, um, I, I years later, I did a master's in games technology and building virtual environments. And the idea always kind of stuck with me. It's possible to use immersive environments to teach language and to become immersed and understand more language. So with this new novel technology, it was around 2016. So it was really when VR was starting to be talked about. It seemed like a really great and interesting way to introduce myself into um, how to use VR in interesting and new ways. Um, and then I suppose from there, after developing and building my uh, VR technology, it was really interested in implementing educational theories into these new technologies to kind of borrow from long lasting older ideas we have about education and then seeing how they're implemented in a new technology. So that brought me to where I am now, which is where I work in the simulation center in RCSI. Because very interestingly, healthcare has been looking at simulation a lot longer than just VR technology for education. 
And my job now is I work within human simulation where we implement all these different educational theories on human uh, um, simulated patients and other work like that. But there's also VR instruments involved as well. So that's a little bit about me, Niall. Thanks a million. Um, hi there, I'm uh, Alistair McBride. Uh, um, I'm a medical doctor with a degree in, in neuroscience and uh, uh, higher diplomas in pharmaceutical medicine, higher medical training in pharmaceutical medicine. I lecture in pharmaceutical medicine uh, and also happen to be the uh, the deputy medical director of Pfizer. But my my journey with um, with virtual reality technology as a as a method to educate in in medicine uh, started whilst I was a uh, a practicing um, anaesthetist uh, and in, an intensivist. Um, and where it kind of uh, stemmed from really was I think I think was uh, learning trying to learn anatomy as a as a as a medical student and a junior doctor. And they say that um, uh, a medical student will learn more new words in the first. Um, uh, the first uh, year of their degree uh, than a language student will uh, learn in their entire degree. And, and that language can be quite esoteric. Uh, and, and therefore, you're trying to learn anatomy. Certainly back in the 90s, uh, you were trying to learn anatomy. Well, I believe you can a, see and hear me, which is wonderful. Uh, but I can't see or hear anybody the, else. Uh, so this is a new experience the, for me. Um, so I have no idea who said what so far. But I know what Nisha has said has been uh, very interesting because he's already told me this. So I'm going to go over to Alistair. Um, and Alistair, uh, hopefully all this is making sense to you guys. But Alistair, um, I wanted to make that link uh, from language uh, and, and kind of if you could talk about the beginning of your journey. And I know you thought that you, you, you looked at language as being uh, something that was, I suppose, a little bit obtuse. Uh, and that began your journey into how can we use um uh, more, more, a more visual way of of uh, of educating. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Neil. I was uh, uh, about halfway through uh, whilst we lost you there. Um, and yeah, the 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 trying to understand anatomy through a, a two dimensional uh, medium as a textbook, and then relying on the the ability of a lecturer to communicate uh, a two dimensional uh, um, a three dimensional structure to you in in, in language uh, really depends on your ability to actually understand that language and visualize it uh, and i kind of thought i remember having this thought uh, when i was studying for my uh, membership exams at the college of uh, anesthetics in the uk uh, that wouldn't it be great if you could you could actually sit inside the body and, and actually have a look around in a virtual reality experience and try and transcend uh, a lot of that rather esoteric Latin, most of uh, esoteric language, most of it uh, obviously taking its uh, roots in in uh, Latin and ancient Greek, um, and then it kind of took me one stage one stage further, where not only can you sit in a, uh, inside the body um, and uh, and have a look around at the different structures and and build up a sense of 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 how things look inside you, but also physiology and how they how things work. Uh, and I thought, you know, wouldn't it be wouldn't it be kind of cool to sort of sit in the heart and actually have a look at how the heart functions or even be a, a, a sodium ion uh, and travel through the kidney? And one of the one of the most difficult things or certainly uh, myself and many colleagues struggled with at medical school was understanding the, the filter function of the kidney. And if you could actually be a sodium ion and actually follow uh, the, the path of sodium or water or potassium or whatever it is actually through the kidney uh, without necessarily having to too much understand the language that you you may actually uh, develop a, a, a faster and a, and a greater depth of understanding. And, and I took this kind of idea uh, into my career uh, in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, I, I wasn't really sure what ever to do with it, but I had a chat with um, somebody at, at Pfizer who headed up our digital marketing and, and told her my ideas about um, virtual reality for 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 medical education, um, and that uh, that brought me to to VStream, where we uh, began to partner on 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 a, on an immersive experience inside the uh, the, the body to communicate what uh, the first first version was, what atrial fibrillation is. Um, you know, big words that perhaps don't mean a lot to many people, uh, and and what a stroke is, and what actually happens uh, inside the uh, inside the body uh, when a when a stroke occurs. So that's that's a, in in a sort of nutshell. That's my been my journey uh, in terms of the use of virtual reality technology in the way that we can communicate um, medical uh, information. And I think uh, we've we've still lost. Uh, uh, Niall, so uh, either uh, Adrian or, or, or James maybe want to, 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 to take up on where we were going. Thank you. 
as um, I was briefly introduced earlier, I run a software virtual reality simulation company that mainly deals, as you might have guessed, with the name in medical simulation. So how I got into um, this business was I was actually in medical um, education and I realized that we were doing it all wrong. And I wasn't the only one who realized we were doing it all wrong, but I realized that we could improve it. And that, like Nisha was saying, he sort of got into this in around 2016. There was a major change in virtual reality hardware in 2016. So the type of stuff we're using now, um, I assume, Nisha, you're talking about either the Oculus or the HTC Vive. And um, that type of stuff, if we'd been using it 10 or 15 years ago, would have cost in the hundreds of thousands of dollars or, or euro. And so it would just have been an academic uh, conversation for a university to have, like, should we virtualize simulation? No, because we can't afford it. But suddenly we could have done. So that's how um, I started. But very soon after that, um, I realized that Vir changing virtual uh, changing like physical simulation to virtual reality simulation had a lot of benefits but it was a little bit like going from the blackboard to the whiteboard and saying that was progress or from a book to an ebook and saying that was progress there was a lot of other stuff that needed to be done and um one of the things we're semi obsessed about in the company is big data analytics and the reason for that is for years, everybody else used it except for in education and in healthcare. And it's like, it's the two most important areas of, of really of life. Because if you're, I mean, the people you're educating now, I always say are going to be looking after us in the, in the rest homes when we get older, when we want them to bring us real whiskey, not scotch. And, um, you know, so we, 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 we insist on big data analytics in education because, like, why should your airline know when you're traveling to make the prices more expensive? And why should the supermarket know what types of yogurts you buy so they can hide them in, a, in an aisle you don't normally go down? It's much better to have that in education so you can customize, um, customize education to an individual learner and, and deploy what they need to them at the right time, rather than what we've been doing for hundreds of years, sitting people in rows and teaching them the same information at the same time in the same order. So we sort of combine all of that together. We, we like to say um, we use a few sort of gimmicks a little bit. You know, we, we put things on apps because people like apps, but really it's just another medium of deploying it. So I might I might sort of finish there and I'll hand over to Adrian, um, unless Alex wants to adjudicate here at all. Okay. Thanks a million, James, um, and thanks Alistair and Nisha as well for your journey. Um, it, it, it's great to get everybody else's perspective on this. Um, I suppose just to maybe introduce myself and to say I'm very early on in this journey on the whole area of immersive technologies and AR and VR. Um, I'm a lecturer in the Department of Science in TU Dublin, um, but I'm also a business development partner working really um, closely with the pharmaceutical and the biopharmaceutical industry. So I kind of get both sides of it. I get, you know, the education side and then I get kind of the, the requirements of industry as well for this space and where they want to see it sitting into, you know, their training programs and their education programs. and. In terms of, I suppose, the journey to where we are now, it's about a particular project that we're working on. Um, we have a pilot scale facility in TU Dublin, it's the National Pharmaceutical Education Centre, and it was built back in 2002. It was very much looking towards, you know, working with the pharmaceutical industry to upskill and, you know, to look at, I suppose, simulating different operations that are um, dominant in the industry. And so, you know, over the years, we've had, you know, so many students who have come through the physical entity of our facility and very much, I suppose, over the last couple of years and in the last year as well with, you know, the pandemic and, you know, the, um, I suppose, um, escalation of uh, online teaching and I suppose looking to maybe hopefully going back to a blended learning and teaching approach and um, that we began to see that we had to look towards, you know, making our facility and our offering more current. So 
in an attempt to do that and to make i suppose our physical entity which is our plant as well more relevant we decided to look at you know and um, technology that would look at areas involving some of the virtual operations maybe predictive maintenance data analytics so the current project that we're looking at is an augmented reality environment to allow us to develop um, training and education courses, both our reach out into the industry, but also for our students who are going to be the graduates of the future. So we really want to develop them then. And, you know, there's a learning curve. There's a learning curve for me as an educator um, to understand how does that sit into, I suppose, my curricula and very much aware of, you know, the value of it. And certainly, I suppose, in my communications with industry as well, it's very much informing that choice. Um, so. Looking forward to talking a little bit more today and learning from everybody as well. Okay, I think Niall is still out of the room, so um, just going to hand it over maybe. Alistair, um, I suppose the, the the last year has has demonstrated a lot and we've, you know, Industry 4.0 is all back there, but the whole area of digitalization has kind of become much more rapid over the last year. Um, how do you see maybe pharma um, going to the next stage in terms of the implementation of immersive technologies and its reach out into education as well. Uh, thanks, Adrian. Yeah, I, I think um, the, the first steps that the pharmaceutical industry may take uh, with immersive experiences will be through education. Uh, I'm not, I, I think eventually we'll end up with um, uh, experiences and, and digital solutions that complement uh, medicines uh, and how they're the, how they're given, uh, particularly around the the uh, if we can crack the the sort of nut of of adherence and compliance with with medication, that's been something that the the medical profession, uh, pharmacy um, carers have been wrestling with uh, forever, uh, and and whether we we you know we can find a digital solution or solutions that can help us in that space i think will uh, will will take some time to 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 realize uh, but i think the 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 education piece around uh, helping patients understand uh, the the disease that they have um, uh, and i draw really on the experience that uh, i've had with with atrial fibrillation and, and stroke as working with with vstream uh, in these patient experiences that um, you're, you're able to take again somebody inside the body, transcend the language, uh, and educate them on what uh, a particular condition is. Um, and I, I think that that is that's quite an important thing to 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 do. I think it's uh, cert I mean it's, it's it's not easy. It takes a lot of work, but it's certainly one of the the sort of the quicker wins I think that the pharmaceutical industry can can have when it comes to uh, our engagement. Um, uh, with our, with our patients, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, when when I sort of think of the, uh, the 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 project that we did on on atrial fibrillation a couple of years ago, um, that we were able to uh, create an experience uh, and to see it roll out uh, on particularly on social media and the feedback that came back. Uh, I remember one gentleman saying uh, that he'd had atrial fibrillation for seven years and didn't actually know really what it was, yeah. um, and that he now did. That he'd had a time, he'd had the time to 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 enjoy the experience or or, or get something from it, uh, and now understood what it was that was going on inside his body, uh, and therefore the the reasons that perhaps he he was now taking the treatment um, that that he was on, and what it what it kind of is really about is complementing that relationship between the healthcare professional and the and the patient. It's not something that uh, yeah. uh, obviously you know we want any experience to interfere with more to complement uh, that relationship and we certainly certainly found that uh, the the experience that we put together uh, a few years back was being used uh, in the clinic so i think in the immediate phase it will be certainly the educational space uh, that immersive uh, technology for the industry will will will, yeah. will certainly go with for the next uh, for the next couple of years Adrian, and i, I think the back end of that alistair there because i'm hearing the word visualization and you know, when I hear that, you know, I, I can see my students in terms of, you know, how they see things. And I, I, I sometimes think that's the bit that we're missing as well in, in education, you know, the whole visualization. And, you know, there's some really great examples out there of what you've just spoken about. Um, I'd love to see one for the vaccination program for people to really understand what's actually going on, you know, truly understand when they begin, when they get their vaccine, what actually happens. So, yeah, I'm going to hand you over to Alex, actually. 
Yes, I hope people can hear me. Maybe give me a thumbs up on the panel. That's yeah. great. I, I, I'm acting as the voice of, of Neil now. I am so sorry for Neil, who put so much effort into preparing the panel, as I think they'll attest. And we are struggling in a big way to get him into the panel. So apologies to, to you, Neil. That's what I want to say in the first instance. But uh, he will act, his presence will be felt because he is able to, <laughs> he is able to send us uh, questions in the back chat, I understand. So I'm going to uh, try and act uh, as, as a chair in his in his stead. And uh, I do want to thank you, Adrian, as well. You've been doing fantastic work there. Um, question for you, Nisha, which is uh, maybe you can tell us um, a little bit about your own design-based research. Yeah, so uh, basically, I think I can link in a lot with a lot of what Alistair was talking about with the visualization ideas. So basically, in my own uh, PhD, the main methodology behind it was this idea called design-based research. So I alluded to it slightly when I was talking about how I was really interested in implementing educational theories. Um, but the basic idea around it is, so it, as developers and when you're working with technology, everyone's heard of things like using agile development to develop products. But in the research world, we don't really work in an agile capacity. It's far closer to that waterfall model of, starting in your first step and then implementing slowly through your steps. So you start off with an idea and then you try and test out if this idea is true or false. And that's the end of your research to see, did we get a positive or a negative? Design-based research is really interested in more of an agile approach where we actually prototype out ideas. But while we're prototyping out what's happening, we're also seeing engaging what's happening in these environments as well. So it's really interesting in the healthcare space, the education space, and especially spaces like VR, which are big complex contexts with loads of variables going on. And because there's so many variables going on, it's really difficult to you know, pick out that one thing you're testing and measuring. So what I'm very interested in is kind of seeing the overall landscape and then implementing theories inside it, say, well, this is what we think is going on. And I think where that really links in nicely to what Alistair was talking about in these tools to visualize and where he's building these tools that can kind of visualize out ideas a lot of the work that i did in vr came to this point of um understanding that a lot of vr work is connected to how people feel within this journey and when they're immersed within it how they actually get on because they have quite a unique experience it's really interesting within these contexts how anyone who puts the headset on suddenly has an experience quite unique to them you can develop the context around it and you can build what's happening in that environment but you can't actually feel or experience what that user goes through uh, word for word through it. So it's really interesting. And I'm really interested in this idea of visualizing what we see and then let our users go through them, see what they experience and kind of have their own experience through it. And I think it also ties into where we are with education as a whole in seeing everyone's journey is quite unique to themselves, right? And what we're trying to do is kind of show them all these tools and sources and different information so they can kind of develop themselves. And it's all about personal growth, I think. And I think VR is really interesting for building up that kind of idea of personal growth and personal learning and development. So yeah. Thanks, Nisha. And I'm delighted to be back. Uh, and Speaking of journeys, I've been on a very exciting journey uh, to get back here. So thanks for your patience, guys. I, I obviously shouldn't have said that at the beginning, there'll be some technical difficulties. I did that to myself, it's my own fault. So I do apologize. Thank you for uh, struggling on. Um, from that point, Nisha, uh, Alistair, I want to want to go back to you on this. Um, and I may have, I don't want, I want to make sure I'm not repeat going over old ground here. But uh, could you talk a little bit um, about uh, about about the work that you're doing at the moment? So obviously, you began with uh, atrial fibrillation, uh, and then we're now talking about stroke. Um, and, and I suppose the you know the the uh, within that, when we talk about design, we 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 introduced or you introduced you invented the character Harv. So you can talk. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, Harv is uh, first of all. I named Har Harv is a, a, a little robot uh, that takes you through uh, the body. Um, he's he's non-threatening. Uh, he speaks. Uh, you know, simple, simple lay language. Uh, he's trying to communicate with with anybody and everybody, from uh, lay people all the way up to the professors of of clinical medicine and and high level scientists. Uh, he's named after William Harvey, who was the father of vascular anatomy uh, uh, at St Bartholomew's Hospital uh, in London, and he kind of looks like the 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 vehicle that was in the movie Inner Space, uh, and that's kind of what he 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 looks like. And he uh, and the work we're doing with him at the moment is we're uh, taking you into the brain, 
uh, because obviously that's where a stroke occurs. And and in in medical education, I think is is it doesn't matter whether you're educating doctors and scientists and pharmacists and nurses or uh, lay people about their health. You have to start with what is normal. And so we take people into the brain and we show them different areas of the brain. Uh, what these different areas do. For example, the, the, the back of your brain is responsible for uh, processing your visual information. Uh, the front of your brain is, is associated with, with memory, mood, uh, your, your sort of thoughts. Uh, the top of your, your head uh, is where uh, movement is initiated from uh, and, and so on. And then we go into the, into the brain and I think most people are kind of familiar uh, with that sort of image inside the head of, 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 of br inside the brain of nerve cells firing away and so on. But also to remember that the brain needs a blood supply. Uh, everything needs a blood supply to, to, to work and function uh, correctly. And, and so what we've done is Harv is taking you into, uh, into, into, a, into a, a, a brain uh, and showing you what happens uh, inside uh, somebody's brain when unfortunately they have um, a stroke and a stroke being a disruption of, of blood supply to an area of the brain uh, and trying to explain why you kind of see uh, in a person who's had a stroke what you see, the signs and the symptoms of, of, of a stroke because the, the bit of their central processing unit, for example, we're all familiar with the, the face drooping and the, the one side of the body being weak and perhaps speech being slurred um, and that's because part of uh, a, a, a very specific part of the brain has been damaged because the the blood supply to that very specific area uh, has been disrupted uh, in some way. And so, what we're trying to do is explain uh, to people uh, who 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 take on this experience what's happened inside them, but also to remind them that many strokes are preventable by controlling blood pressure, by controlling diabetes, by uh, uh, using anticoagulants uh, in, in people who need them, who have atrial fibrillation, and so on, basically managing risk factors. Uh, and so there is a, a sort of you know, what is normal, what happens in the kind of disease state, and perhaps how it can be mitigated. Uh, and that's the, that's the sort of what we've been doing with VStream with, uh, with Harv uh, and an experience around stroke. And then, James, obviously, t going moving from that sort of experience, which is very much, I suppose, a 360 video experience, uh, 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 st albeit still very much about educating patients and educating healthcare professionals, people in general, uh, about sure. stroke. From your point of view, your your your, uh, your platform is very much an interactive virtual reality training platform. Can you talk oh, a little yes. bit about what the difference is then? Yeah, so um, the 360 video compared to... I suppose either like a unity based or an unreal engine based um, player where you need to code everything you see. So every everything what we um, can visualize in our headsets, someone has have had to write, um, I say a line or two of code, but the, the, the developers sometimes uh, criticize me for being so dismissive about what they do for hundreds of hours every month. Um, and what that allows us to do is not only to collect the data, and I'm going to probably stop talking about data very soon because people get fed up when I talk about it all the time, but we, we can then basically put in hooks and get anything we want. And we can also put in the, in the hooks to put things in. So sensation is very important for us. We're, do, we're um, simulating different types of surgery at the moment. And we're just going through what we call spikes, which are just to everyone else, a sort of little experiments. And we're trying to find out the most, um, the most realistic feedback we can get from uh, an area of the human body. So um, to allow trainee surgeons to perform these operations. Now, virtual reality has a lot of benefits and I know you've all used it, so I'm, you know, like when, when I talk about it, sort of people sometimes say to me, oh, but, you know, when you're feeling something in virtual reality, it doesn't feel just like, you know, if you pick up a cup in virtual reality, it doesn't feel like you pick up a cup in the real world. And you're like, yes, no, we don't have that yet. I blame the hardware um, developers for that. But, you know, they will eventually catch up with the software developers. The For the time being, what we're, what we're relying on is what I call a little bit of magic. Because, I mean, even in the real world, we don't see everything and we don't feel everything, but our brain does an amazing amount of work. So, for example, I can see five people on this screen, but I can only really see you from the torso up. 
my brain is assuming you've got a waist and legs and I, I wouldn't be surprised if um, Neil stood up and I saw his knees. You know, so my brain is going on through all of this stuff in the background. So we need to, in our virtual environment, code what we can and what we can do much, much better in a virtual reality environment than you can in a physical environment. And then, because um, Adrian was talking about blended learning earlier, and that is so important because, I mean, Full disclosure here, I run a software company that does medical simulation, okay? So I should be saying all simulation should be done in virtual reality, but it shouldn't be because there are other areas where at the moment it is much better to go in and see patients and, you know, train in that environment. But that shouldn't be your first port of call. Um, Neil knows and a couple of people in the backstage that I put some slides together in the last sort of 19 minutes because the previous talk, they all had slides and videos. And I thought, well, I better get something together. And I do have a picture of either a hamster or a guinea pig. And I, I sometimes use it because I sort of say, you know, you don't want to be this person in the hospital. You want the people who are coming in to do the operation on you, to have done 50, to have got their feedback, to have, to have made their improvements, but then they need to go in, finish off, and you don't want to be the hamster or the guinea pig, whatever it is, you know? Um, so in our virtual world, we are making the most of what we can do, but we are also relying on touch points in other areas. So we're bringing in a lot of augmented reality at the moment, and I'm trying to mix the two. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to achieve that, but it's certainly something we're going down the pathway at the moment. Did that, did that answer your question, Neil? Yeah, absolutely. And I think you brought up an interesting point there, um, which I'm going to go to you, Nisha, on. This is that idea of presence. So how, how real it feels. And obviously you can have haptic feedback and all that sort of thing that people are, are working on from a technology point of view. But you've looked at that the kind of psychology around that, Nisha. Can you talk a little bit about, about that? Have I got that right? Presence? Am yeah, I you do. Yeah. The right term? So yeah. yeah, so it's really interesting. So another part of my research was dividing out immersion and this psychological term of presence. OK, so the way I divide it out in my research, and again, there's a lot of different people who discuss these terms, and it very much links into what James was saying there, in that presence is your subjective sense when you get into these VR worlds. It's that sense of, oh, I'm here. Whereas immersion, um, I kind of defined as the the attributes that the technology is bringing you. So like, the fidelity of the screen maybe what's the what's the i'm trying to think the the amount of vision you can see around it all those things we can measure straight away get an analytical tool and say yep yeah, that's where we are with it but then presence is that subjective sense so it's that feeling of where we are so i think it really links into what james was saying in the guesswork parts so you'll see in a lot of like virtual reality applications and experiences we have right now you see a lot of work in the tricks so one trick that everyone probably knows by now whenever you try out a VR device is it's really good at measuring um, making people feel like they're really high up. So anything where you can look down and say, oh, wow, I think I'm going to gonna fall is something that VR does really, really well now. And the same with height of people. It's another um, thing. If you build loads of big models and get people to look up, it looks like you're really small all of a sudden. And there's a lot of smaller things like this with VR that the tool is really, really good at visualizing and implementing. And I think, again, it like it adds into what uh, James is saying. I think VR is a really useful at what it's really good at and what it's not as good at, we shouldn't be using VR for, but we should be finding those areas that, wow, VR, and in a lot of areas, I think what we can do with VR is different than what we can do and simulate in real life. And that's a good thing. So we should be using VR separate to our high fidelity real life situations. Like where I work right now is in human based simulation. So we're looking at what are people good at doing? What can we simulate with people that doesn't need any technology? And there's some areas that people are just better at simulating. But then there's other areas where VR really has things we could never do. We can fly in VR. We can create worlds. We can do anything we want at all. So within those applications, that's where we should be looking for, I think, a lot of the time, not how do we make this as high fidelity as possible to do what we can already learn and teach in the real world. We should be looking to do more and different and use our real world applications just to tie in with what James was saying there that way. So I hope that answers your question a little. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think what you, you mentioned there, that kind of the human element, and Adrian, I, I'm going to go to you on this, but, mm. you know, the human element is obviously really, really important. This is all about being human centric in some ways. But for, for you guys starting on this journey, uh, obviously this technology is open to you, but you've taught in other ways before. So what kind of, why did you feel that it was important to to start looking at this technology and embracing this technology? Yeah, thanks, Niall. Um, and thanks, Nisha, kind of for, for that lead in there as well, because I suppose one of the things that I've certainly observed over the last year is, you know, engagement of our students, you know, to try and, uh, and I suppose it's aligned very much with retention as well. So I suppose I begin to see that the opportunities here for, you know, the use of some of the immersive technologies in education, it's, it's not so much necessarily just about education, it's also about you know, engaging them in other aspects of life. So when we begin to look at, you know, encouraging students in second level, maybe to look at some STEM programs, you know, maybe this is this is the way we do it as well. I, I also think it can very much support us maybe in some ways through in distance education, which obviously we've been doing for the last year. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting back into college with my students to meet with them so that we have that human interaction because I think it's going to be crucial for them, you know, long term. But certainly I think innovations like this will will assist us and, you know, they'll they'll certainly help with, you know, critical thinking, communication, collaborative work as well. But I think they have their place. And I'm really excited to see as we're moving into looking at some new program development to see how do we actually embed them within our curricula? How do we use them, but use them correctly? And uh, I'm, I'm definitely reaching out to Nisha afterwards uh, for, for some thoughts on, you know, that design thought process as well associated with that. Um, I suppose also with my reach out into industry, um, you know, they're very, they're very aware of the need to have highly trained staff, um, but to do it in a way that they don't actually compromise production. So um, looking to where, where they can utilize it, where it's, where it's appropriate, and subsequently then the on the job training is that a little bit easier to do because you know they've done a lot of the uh, the donkey work beforehand before they get them into a manufacturing environment and especially i suppose when we're looking at the whole area of steriles and alistair probably would uh, know an awful lot more in from a uh, you know the um the perspective of the farm industry but just from the whole area of contamination control you know it's a, it's a big issue out there for you know a lot of the parental products so I suppose there's lots of applications that I can see both in an edu from an education perspective, whether it's a student in college or from a training perspective of, you know, somebody who's doing uh, who's doing work in the industry. So, uh, James, I'm going to go to you because, you know, you just to talk about, you know, the barriers uh, to to actually bring this technology uh, on board and getting people to adopt it. Can you talk to me a little bit about the beginning of your journey, the post-it note? Where you know, basically, it was clearly you know what you know where I'm going with this. I know exactly. And, and where basically, you're tell us how I easy it was. I used when I described it to you, so I have to leave out a few adjectives in the very least. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I was talking to Neil the other night um, when we had the sort of one-on-one -on -one chat, and when the concept came to me of simulating some of the um, initial radiographies. Uh, practice i had been brought down by some friends of mine who were software engineers and they said james you know we're going to show you something it's uh, virtual reality and i sort of dismissed it and i said yeah i've seen some of that a few years ago and they said no you can't have done because it's very very new and i said yeah i had a had a thing strapped to my head and i raced a car and they said no that was a screen strapped to your head this is virtual reality so i eventually went down to the um to the uh company they worked in and i realized yes it's different if you haven't used virtual reality the first time you put it on you just like oh my god this this is this i'm in the real world you know but i was they put me in a castle and i was um, shooting arrows at um at people don't, yeah, i don't have to go into a huge amount of detail here i don't think this is the important part of the story and but i could feel the the arrow in my hand and i could feel the string quiver when it left and i i could see people getting you know an arrow in the neck and all sorts of things and um i was like i don't care what this is i know it's a whole bunch of code but i said could you develop a hospital um 
And uh, so one of the software developers sort of said, yeah, well, you know, it's just a matter I, of I still time. can't hear anyone, if you can hear me. We can, we can hear you. We can hear you, yeah. yeah. Um, can you hear me? I can, yeah, James, you, you keep oh, going. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, so I sort of said, right, well, we need to get a hospital developed and we need to, um, we need to virtualize our simulation. And I went back to the dean and I sort of said to him, look, I've, I've sorted out the problem of the uh, uh, simulation that we've got. And he said, great, because it was well known and it had been well known for a long time that there was a problem with simulation. And he said, what is it? And I said, we're going to. We're going to make it virtual. We're going to virtualize uh, all of the simulation. And then, you know, we're going to allow students to have a lot more access, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, it sounds fascinating. Do you know how you're going to do it? And I said, not yet. He said, right. He said, do you know how much it's going to cost? And I said, oh, I would say between a million and $2 million, give or take. And, um, and he said, do you know how long it's going to take? And I would say, I would, I said, probably, between 18 months and two years. And he gave me a post-it note and he said, can you jot that down for me? Because I'll be taking it to the board on Friday. And I did, I jotted it down and I didn't realize that was his sort of tell. And he said, James, I'm kidding. You can't wander in here with no business plan or anything like that and ask for up to $2 million, you know, two years of research time, et cetera, et cetera. He said, it sounds like a fantastic idea. So you should go and do it yourself. So I went back to my office and I typed into a search engine, how do you start a company? And it turns out it's quite easy. It's probably a little bit too easy to start a company because I started one that day and uh, that was called virtual medical coaching. And um, yeah, you know, we did, we did the virtualizing of the simulation that we needed to. We've since been, we've since been growing. We've been adding a lot of um, uh, features to it. In fact, I was fortunate enough to get a, a text from one of the users of our software a few minutes ago and he said i'm waiting to, to get the new dashboards rolling out so uh yeah you will be john uh, next week you'll be getting them you know and we we have this expression that we don't use the f word in the software development lab and that f word is finished because i mean other ones get thrown around with gay abandon but we we never say that product's done because you know it's never going to be it was finished in 2017. It was all also finished in 2018 and 19. And then in 2020, when we realized a lot of people didn't have access to their virtual reality headsets, we developed a desktop edition of what we had. And that's gone really well as well. And then, you know, so, and, and I think that is what you need to do. So you're talking about barriers. The barriers are changing minds. And that's always going to be the hard thing. And I, and I think, um, like Nisha pointed out, we we kind of kicked off in 2016. I think it was the HTC Vive was released in November 2016. Um, so 2017, really, people had started to hear about this. They said, "Oh, it's a gamey thing." <laughs> We're like, yeah, it, it can be. So you know, it took us 18 months for people to take us seriously, and that we weren't just a bunch of guys living in our mother's basement creating fun stuff um now that you know there's been, there's been a lot of validation going around the world if you look at the bmj if you look at the new england journal of medicine and if you look at you know some of the more serious medical journeys they all regularly talk about virtual reality simulation and these are now getting to be quite serious studies it's not just do the surgeons prefer training on a virtual reality um model rather than the cadaver because you know enjoyment is one thing but actually results and competence that's what's being measured now and these are longitudinal trials and they're very robust i mean to get into the new england journal of medicine you know it's it's not a slouch of a journal so um the, neil you know i do this I, I answer four or five other questions and then i try and come <laughs> back to yours um so the the biggest barrier was people's attitude and we were very lucky early on we met some really good people and um they kind of gave us a bit of a break and then they were our market validation so on the back of them 
we were able to sort of say, well, look, these crowd are doing it and they're doing really well and these other people are doing it. And then, you know, so that's kind of the first mover. And then you have other people who are sort of hanging back cautiously, but they see them go and they go, right. So maybe if other, you know, they're doing it, it could work for us. And then you get a little bit of momentum. And I think that's where we're at now. That's great. Uh, um, I'm conscious there's a few uh, a few questions and comments. Uh, I, I know we're, we're about to run out of time, but um, guys, if you look at, um, at, at in the comments section, you see there mm -hmm. um, from Mary Raw uh, to Adrian, um, there's uh, there's a few questions there. So because yeah. we're going out of time, I might ask you to, to just take a look at them and, and you might be able to, uh, if you get a chance, jump into the networking session. Um, but there's some great stuff there from Danielle Whelan, Richard Armstrong, Mary Raw. Um, I want to thank everybody uh, a lot. We, we'll keep going until Alex jumps back in and kicks us off because we had so many technical issues. Alistair, have we got you back? Yes, if you can uh, hear me, I can now see and hear you. Fantastic, <laughs> that's great. Well, we we uh, just I'd like to I'd like to go back to you um, just to talk about what you think uh, the future holds. Where would you like to see this go from point of view? The technology we have, we obviously have virtual reality, we have big data and AI and all sorts of things. Where would you like to see this, the future of, in particular for what you're doing and the sort of work that you're creating? Um, I, I, a couple of things. I mean, certainly on the healthcare professional side, I would love to see, I would, I would al I've always wanted to see the virtual reality textbook of medicine. Uh, I've always wanted to see that uh, to, to make the understanding uh, of what is something that is a huge subject actually a much more easy for people to 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 get their their head around. Um, so I, I've all my, my as you can probably tell from everything I've said, I'm much more I'm very passionate about the education uh, side of things. Um, I think when it comes to the integration of of a lot of technology into uh, into healthcare, I think it's going to it's going to come down to, to better decision making. Uh, certainly, with regard to big data and so on. You know, in medicine, we have guidelines, guidelines and and clinical trials, and these are based on really an average, uh, which and you know no, nobody no you know there's there's there is only a small sector of society that you can kind of call the the necessarily the average, and these guidelines don't necessarily apply to everybody all of the time. And, and and if you're 80 years of age, you, you have probably four chronic health conditions, and therefore you're probably on four different guidelines. Uh, and these guidelines don't actually are not actually designed really to talk to each other. Um, and I think as we as we as we generate um, uh, data and we have much much better uh, means of analysing it, I think you'll you'll begin to see actually um, the almost interplay actually between different conditions and how they are how they are managed. I mean, these, this is beyond my, my uh, you know, limit of, of, of actually understanding. I'm not a big data uh, guy, but I, I, I can see where it can be implemented for the betterment of, uh, of, of healthcare. Um, and I think also when you when you look inside the body, I think when you can start uh, visualizing, I'm coming back to using um, uh, virtual reality as a as a kind of solution. When you look at if you take somebody who's again got four health conditions on twelve medicines, um, if once you can sort of teach a system, and so I'm sort of thinking about AI, and I'm thinking of using virtual reality, and and as a doctor and a scientist looking at let's say drug interactions. I think you're 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 really onto something to see the interplay of physiology uh, and pharmacology inside a patient who's got who's who's a very specific patient, rather than again this this sort of average that we uh, use. And and what I'm kind of going to finish with are the two two words that I think a lot of this technology will lead us to is personalised medicine. And I think that that's that's the future. That's where we're headed. Um, I think the the more personal medicine is, the better the outcome. Uh, and I don't just mean uh, from from getting the right dose in the right patient at the right time. I also mean from a holistic perspective uh, that that medicine, very various areas of medicine, have become very siloed over the years, very subspecialized. Uh, but this is, all happens inside the body of the same person. Uh, and that can we bring with big data and uh, artificial intelligence and the use of virtual reality technologies? Can we bring all that together to? again try and look a bit more holistically at an individual uh, and that's kind of where i see uh, the future of all this technology coming together to to personalize medicine 
Fantastic. Well, no better note to uh, to end on. Alistair, James, Adrian, Nisha, thank you so much for your patience and your contribution. Really, really appreciate it. Apologies to everybody uh, for the technical uh, for the technical challenges. And again, thanks to Alex and to the audience for listening. We very much appreciate it. Enjoy the next session. Thanks very much, guys. If you want to.